In Acts, the second chapter, Peter and the apostles are accused of being drunk by the Jews in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter then tells them that they are not drunk, but that this was prophesied to happen by an Old Testament prophet some 800 years before the Messiah or Jesus was to come. Now Jesus also quotes this same prophet along with building onto his prophecies about the signs that will be given to the last generation. The Lord also says that of that day and hour no man will know specifically, but we will know the seasons. So ask yourself, are you prepared for eternity and do you know the signs that are in the Bible? Let's find out next. For God's elect, who are of the bride of Christ, we are always in anticipation while we are looking for the day of our Lord and watching for signs coming on the earth which might give us a clue as to where we are in time, specifically. For those that can't see that there is something wrong with this world here and now and have everything going their way in this life, then this day will be a day of terror and a day of judgment. In the intro, we started out in Acts, the second chapter, saying how the Holy Spirit would be given to the Gentiles. And let's read that, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is the third hour of the day. Their days started at 6 a.m., so this was about 9 in the morning. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. We will get into what that means when we read Joel here shortly. So let's start off with a little background on prophets. The prophet was a man who the Lord talked to and sent to the priests and the kings as when God sent Nathan to David over his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband Uriah the Hittite. Now let's read Joel's announcement starting in chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Automatically, you should know this gives him authority from God himself, and we need to pay attention to what he is saying. Joel is generally admitted to be the first prophet to southern Judah, preceding Amos and Isaiah. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell you your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Joel is announcing a judgment of famine is coming from the word of the Lord, whom we all know is Jesus. They were all warned about this in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Now the curses they were warned about are starting to come to pass. Notice how they are called drunkards in verse 5. Isaiah uses this same terminology in the 28th chapter of his book. This famine means that they aren't going to have any harvest of wheat to make bread, as verse 9 says. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. 
They mourn because the people would rather be drunk on wine than give the Lord his due of their tithes and their offerings, which they were required to do daily with the morning and evening sacrifice. The Lord has had enough of it. As we read in verse 14, he tells them to call a fast. Sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all of the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. The fast, or the abstaining of food, was called an outward token of sorrow for sin. Let's continue in chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now the day of the Lord is coming, and the ones that fear him will take heed and repent. When the trumpet was blown, it was sounding an alarm for every single person that was in earshot to be required to come, no matter what they were doing, to appear before the temple of God. A day of darkness and a day of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be more after it, even to the years of many generations. Even the plagues of Egypt were not like it. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is thus the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. There have been many of the scholars who have noted how the shape of a grasshopper's, or you could say also the locust's head, is identical to that of the horse. Do you think that this is by a fluke of nature or by evolution? Not a chance. The Lord is sovereign in everything he does. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of the flame of the fire that devoureth the stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their faces the people will be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They're going to be sitting there and won't be able to do a thing about how the locusts eat up all their food. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Israel has never seen this before. They have languished, pretty much like America does now. Let's read verse 10. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. There is going to be so many of these locusts, they will block out the light of all these sources of light. This is the shadow here, and we will get into the very image of this when we get into the New Testament. Where did all this come from? Who is at the head of the pack doing all this? Let's read in verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. The Lord God tells you what you have to do to get back in his good graces right here. It's not a big mystery. If you are as Joel called them in, back in verse 5, then you're a drunkard and you're a servant of sin. Everyone needs to repent. Do you smoke or drink? Repent or go on in your sin and reap your rewards now and later.
We, as the elect of God, are called in righteousness to be servants to him. When we do repent as his elect, and we just read what he will do for us, let's get a second witness to that as spiritual Israel, because literal Israel never did that. When we skip down to verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. When you witness to folks about predestination and the doctrine of election, know that he is with you. The next verse is where Joel prophesies of the times after Christ's death on the cross. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Do you see how this is not restricted to any age or any gender? This is what happened to the church starting at Pentecost in Acts, the second chapter. Does this mean that there are prophets or seers now? Some may tell you that they see things, but there's a severe penalty for them when they are wrong. They die. Besides that, we have the Word of God in the pages of Scripture now, so there is no need for that anymore. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. This is the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in 70 AD. Those that didn't go along peaceably were slaughtered. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. The sun was darkened at the crucifixion. Let's read that in Luke, the 23rd chapter, verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. When he rent or tore the veil in half from top to bottom in the temple, it was a sign he tore up the covenant with the literal Jews and confirmed what Joel had said about what was about to happen at Pentecost. In the Old Testament, the Jews were the chosen few. Now it is the elect that are the chosen few of the New Testament. Let's read that in Romans 11 and verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. The predestinated elect of the New Testament are the chosen few now. In the Old Testament, Joel prophesied of the coming of the day of the Lord. So where are we in time now? Are there patterns we can identify in the scripture where God gives us clues as to what is going to happen and when? Yes, I believe he has left us plenty of clues for his people to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And let's verify that when we read Matthew 13 and verse 10. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore speak I unto them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. Jesus goes on to tell them that he has to heal them. He came not to save the righteous, or self-righteous, but the sinner. The hearing ear and the seeing eye is much more often given to the sinner than to the rich. This can also be said of who he has given faith to as well. 
In Genesis, the first chapter, we can start to see the pattern God used in his work week. He worked six days and rested on the seventh. Now, in 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 8 states, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. For right now, we are going to use this as our unit of measure. For a second witness to this, let's read uh, Psalm 90 and verse 4. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. The Jews had three watches in the night. So with three watches in the night, or you could call them guard duty, does that mean that in God's sight there could be 3,000 years in a night? The point is, the Bible is saying that it is not necessarily a literal 24 hours, which is what's called a day. We're going to go into another study coming up where we will be going over the six days of creation after the next study, which is on the rapture. So stay tuned. It will stay interesting around here if you like the truth, that is. Anyway, from Adam to Jesus, it is estimated that there was around 4,000 years, plus or minus 25 years or so. That is roughly four days. So we also know that our current calendar years are off maybe by as much as two years, even up to 11 years. Back in 2012, ABC News did a, an interview with the Pope at that time, and he, even he admitted that it was off uh, upwards of two to seven years. The calendars were recalculated around 525 AD by a monk called Dionysius Exiguus, who made a miscalculation in the year. So we really do not have any finite year we can measure from. We call this calendar year 2022 right now. It could be actually 2011. It could be 2033. We just don't know for sure. We know it's roughly been a little over 2,000 years or two days since the Lord was here physically. So we are somewhere close to the end of that six day or 6,000 year period of man being on this earth. But how does that stack up with the book of Revelation? In the 20th chapter, verse 1 states, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. What's amazing is how many commentaries think that this is Satan, but it's not. It's Jesus, as we know, who holds the keys to hell and death in the first chapter. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. When Satan was loosed, I could not venture to say, but in both verses, he was bound a thousand years. In the Greek, the word thousand is kilia, and the word is plural. So plural means two or more. Could this mean it could be 2,000 years? Yes, I believe it can. We are still working on a scale. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years here. We also know that Jesus was resurrected on the third day. Now let's look back in the Old Testament in the book of Hosea. If you have any questions about the book of Revelation, usually you can find out a lot of your answers back in the Old Testament. Let's turn to chapter 6 and read verse 2. After two days he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. This was a prophecy about Jesus, as it was never fulfilled at all in the Old Testament. Hosea expressly states here, after two days, he will revive us. Remember still, our time equivalent of a day equals a thousand years. The main theme of this verse is revival or resurrection, and how Jesus restores his predestinated elect to divine favor and protection as they are now raised to be equal in favor with the angels, being the children 
of the resurrection. He will continue doing this in the little season of Satan until the last sheep comes into the fold. This is why we have to carry our cross daily and witness to folks about predestination, the doctrine of election, and the sovereignty of God. Remember when we read about the plague of locusts in the book of Joel? That was the shadow of the Old Testament. The locusts ate up the wheat which they made in the bread. Their appearance was as horses in chapter 2, verse 4. Let's take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. So we have the smoke as from a great furnace, from the bottomless pit, which blocks the light. Didn't Jesus say he was the light of the world in John 8? Let's move on. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now we have the very image, a plague of locusts. But what is that? The scripture just equated locusts with scorpions, didn't it? In the Middle East, a scorpion was a false teacher, which makes sense as the beast rises up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 17. In the next verse, the Bible says they couldn't hurt any green thing or any tree. This could be equated to plant life. They can only hurt those that do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. This would be the non-elect or the reprobate. It reminds me of 2 Peter 3, 3 verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Expect this kind of response sometimes. The next verse starts off with the phrase, For this they are willingly ignorant of the word of God, and by the same word they are reserved for fire in the day of judgment, down in verse 7. They have been deceived is the way the Bible describes it. As Jesus said, the end of time will come just like the, it did in the days of Noah in Genesis 6. There is more end time prophecy in the synonymous chapters of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 than the whole book of Revelation. So let's look at Matthew 24 first and read that starting in verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Let's take a look at this word coming. In the Greek, it is the word parousia. In the context of this verse that they are talking about, his, it's his second coming or his physical arrival, which is described in Revelation 19. In fact, let's read that starting in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John, the first chapter, says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, who was Jesus. When he comes back, he will have eyes as a flame of fire. When he splits the skies open, then all these scoffers at predestination and election will wish they had never been born. Let's go back to Matthew 24 and read verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Most of the world is deceived right now because the real Jesus has hid himself from it. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. The world has the other Jesus. Paul calls him another Jesus, another spirit and another gospel, who is Satan transformed into an angel of light. Isn't Satan said to deceive the whole world in Revelation 12? This is how they are deceived. The Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus the world knows with his little halo behind his head. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure until the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. That said the gospel of the kingdom, which is the kingdom of God or Israel. We as the elect are spiritual Israel now. Let's skip down to verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Think about what Jesus is saying here. It is going to be worse than any war we've ever heard of. Any atrocities that anyone has ever been subjected to, and it's coming to this generation. The writing is on the wall, folks. It's just starting with the way our government is now. They are trying to control the population through a not-so-subtle or veiled propaganda in the media even now. And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. God shall shorten those days because if he didn't, there wouldn't be any elect saved alive. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The elect know the difference because God has written his word in their hearts, so it's not possible to deceive them. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. He is not hidden out in Utah as some folks would have you to believe. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is how Jesus will come back, and it's going to be that fast. So how can it be said that this generation that is walking around here and now is the last generation? Jesus tells us that as well when we skip down to verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putting forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Israel was compared to a fig tree in the books of Hosea and Jeremiah. When the trees have leaves, summer is here, and the fruit should not be far behind. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all things be fulfilled. When Israel kicked out Syria, Jordan, and Egypt in the Six-Day War of 1967, it became sovereign over its own land again after 2,800 years, kind of. It still has the exception of the occupation in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank with the Palestinians. But from this generation forward is who Jesus is saying will be the last one. Can we see more signs in the Bible about the last days? Jesus gives us a few more clues of what we are to be warned of in Luke 21 when we read verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting 
and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Surfeiting, drunkenness, which can be spiritual as well as literal, are compared to the cares of this life here. Paul gives us a description of what the people of the last generation, this generation, are like. And let's see how close the Holy Spirit got it right when we read 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. One of the most wicked men to ever walk the face of the planet Earth and says he loves God and represents Jesus drives a Ferrari. Does that sound like the Jesus of the Bible who had nowhere to lay his head? Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. They look good in their suit and ties until you gain as godliness. These are the locusts. These are the scorpions that block the light of God's word with good words and fair speeches which flatter the ear of the congregations and their listeners. All the signs are here now and the world is oblivious. We still have the great tribulation to go through and the seven last years with the man of sin, which looks like he is right around the corner. God is moving all his pieces around as he so sees fit. For the elect, I hope this has opened some eyes and rest in what the Lord is doing because we are right at the doorstep of eternity. This Bible study has been made possible by brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your generous tithes, offerings, and contributions. Without you, this program is not possible.